Amen. Thank you. Please go ahead and be seated. Man, what a great time of praise and worship. Amen. Thank you so much for participating. We hope that you at home uh, were able to sense that sweet spirit and that you were able to worship along with us. It's time for our children's church, so kindergarten, first and second graders. If you would like to, you can be dismissed and go to the back with Miss Carrie, and then she'll take you upstairs. Kindergarten, first and second graders. Miss Carrie is waiting back there for you, and uh, she's waving, so you're free to go, and we will see you all here in just a little bit, okay? Well, today what I want to do is I want to start another series of messages over the next few weeks because I believe that we as a country, we as a nation, are at a crossroads, amen? And I believe that it's very important that we as the church and Christians should, and we need to be a big influence on what happens from here on out. As a matter of fact, I think we need to be a bigger influence than we've ever been before. And I think it's time for us to realize that God has placed us here to be a bigger influence. And I believe with all my heart that America can be saved. I believe it. I believe that we can change the course. We can begin to go where God wants us to be. But it's going to be uh, incumbent upon the church to do what God has called us to do, to be who we're supposed to be. And I believe that he has placed us here for such a time as this. And that's going to be the series title over the next several weeks is uh, for such a time as this. And the key scripture is coming from the book of Esther chapter 4, starting at verse 13. And we're going to be reading uh, there today, 13 and 14. Now getting us up to this point, many of you may know and some of you may not know the story of Esther and how King Artaxerxes had uh, disband his wife and and uh, send her off and now she was he was looking for a new wife and Mordecai who was the Jewish man in that time took his niece which was Esther and he she put he put her kind of in the running if you will and that that Artaxerxes had chosen her to be his wife and that Naaman had uh, an, an evil man had begun to want to destroy the Jewish nation. And, of course, Esther, being a Jew herself, was now in position to do something about Naaman. And Mordecai is talking to her, sending a message to her, and this is the message that he sends her to be at such a time as this, that he was asking uh, Esther to make a difference, to make a difference. Now, it's time to make a stand. Now, Esther was in a bad spot here, if you will, in a worldly sense, because if she would have gone in, because uh, the ritual was that the king called his wife in, if she or anyone would want a presence to be in the presence of the king, they would die if he didn't approve it. So she was now being asked of Mordecai to go in to the king and make these statements, make this plea for her, for her people. Just as I believe God is now calling the church to step up into these difficult times and make a plea to the world about their need for Jesus. And so we're going to be looking over the next few weeks at this, and I'm going to be sharing the need for such a time as this. Now I want you to understand I'm not a political pastor. I don't get into politics from the pulpit. But folks, I do get into issues, amen? And if those issues happen to go along with, with the stand of one group or another, so be it. But over the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about these things, but going to take the political part out of it completely, except if you agree or disagree with the stand the Scripture says. Amen? So what I'm going to be looking at today is this idea of call that the church has been placed here for such a time as this. Let's see what Mordecai tells Esther when it's her time to make a decision. Let's go ahead and read Esther chapter 4, starting at verse 13 and 14. Let's stand in honor of reading God's Word this morning. The Bible says here, And Mordecai told them to answer Esther, Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Father, we love you and we thank you for all that you're doing. We thank you for this great nation that we have. And Father, we pray that as this great time of worship continues, that Lord, we could begin to be stirred in our heart and in our spirit to be willing to make a difference in this nation and in this world. 
that, Father, we as the church would begin to realize that we are placed here by you for such a time as this. And that, God, over the next several weeks as I share this text and I share this series, that, Father, you would stir our hearts. You would draw people who are lost to yourself. And that, Father, we could see lives being changed. And, God, we could see our nation heading back to where you want it to be. Father, I pray, as always, that today that these words that I'm about to say, they're not be my words, but they're yours. And Father, I pray that this is not a message that I've come up with, but this is your message. And that, Father, the response be as you desire for it to be. And Father, it is in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Go ahead and be seated. The series is for such a time as this, but the, the, um, the, the title for the message, and Randy, we're not working again. Sorry about that. The title for the message is, strategically placed that we as the church have been strategically placed esther had been strategically placed to be in the position she was in for the time that she was in at that point so what we're going to be looking at today is the idea of us being strategically placed just as esther was the first part that i want to look at today my friend is that esther was not an accident amen Esther was not where she was by accident. She was there designed by God. And we look in chapter 2, we look over into verse 9. It says, Now the young woman pleased him, and she obtained his favor, that God was able to work through them, and that the people around Esther could show find favor in her. We look at uh, verses 15 in the same chapter, and we see there it says, Now when the, the turn came for Esther, the daughter of Abiel, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as daughter to go into the king, she requested nothing but what the Haggai, the king's eunuch, and the custodian of the woman had devised. And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all who saw her. So my friends, what I want you to understand here is that Esther was not there by accident and that God had showed favor on Esther. He showed favor. He put her in that position. He gave her what she was needing to do, to have to be able to do what she was doing. The first thing that we look at is that he gave her a position. That he put her in that place. It was not because of anything other than God's guidance, God's timing, and God's perfect timing that Esther was put in that place. And she was finding favor by the people she was finding favor with. And so she had that position. But the second thing that we look at, and not only did she have the position, but she had the disposition. The disposition to be able to do. Because what disposition is, not if you, you can be in the right place, but have the wrong attitude. Amen? And sometimes we find people that get in the right position, but their attitude is wrong. Esther had the disposition to be able to do that. That was the inherent qualities of mind and character. She was who the nation of Israel needed at that time. Because she had in her to the ability to do that from the position. But in her, her character, she had a fine character about her. My friends, can I tell you today that God has shown mercy on the church as well. So the second point to this is God has shown church the, the church favor. Amen? God has shown us the favor. We as a church, can I tell you that we as a church have been blessed? Amen? First of all, we've been blessed because we have Jesus Christ as our Savior. Amen? Now, what better thing than that can we have? But we have Jesus as our Savior. We have Jesus who empowers us. Jesus who guides us. Jesus who gives us the courage. Jesus who gives us everything that we need. We have been blessed, been shown favor by God. Because not only that, but we have the resources to do what God has wanted us to do. Amen? How many of you were, were here before the, the new section of our building was, was built? How many of y'all remember that? Okay, some of you weren't here. Man, some of you don't realize how blessed we are because you think this has always been here. We who have been here for over five years, we know that we're blessed. Amen. God has given us an amazing building over there to do things that we could not have done prior to the five years when that building was completed. But now that we have it, man, God has positioned us with resources there to be able to do what he wants us to do, to minister to people the way we've never been able to minister before. He has given us the resources, but he's also given us people. Can I tell you that you are not a member of First Baptist Church by accident, and you're not even placed here, even today. You're not watching this program by accident. God designed for you to be here in such a time as this, because basically God wants you to serve him through this place. So you have basically been favored 
And we as a church has been favored by you. And by you watching, we're favored by you. God has blessed us with each other. And to be able to do and, and the talent and the gifts that we have as a church, that there is, can I tell you, there is nothing, nothing, nothing that First Baptist West cannot do by the resources that God has placed in us. We can do amazing things. But so often we begin to look at ourselves and we forget the first favor was Jesus Christ. But not only do we have the resources and the people, but we have been shown favor by the finances. Okay, now I told the first service this isn't a tithing message. But if you take it that way, okay, so be it. But we have been blessed financially to do, again, whatever God wants us to do. Now, we're not been blessed to do whatever we all want to do. But we've been blessed to do what God wants. We, he's shown us favor. I shared with this with you this before, but when we talk about the financial favor that God shows us, it reminds me of the preacher who was standing up before his people, just as I am today, talking about all the resources, talking about the ability to do things. And 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 then the preacher said, "You know what? I've got good news and bad news. The good news is we have every penny that we've ever going to need right now to be able to do what the church wants to do, what God wants the church to do. We have every penny. That's the good news." And he looked at the church and he got real quiet. And he said, "Ah." But the bad news, the bad news that's in your wallets. Amen? So it's there. We have to then be faithful. God has blessed us financially to be able to do whatever He wants us to do. He would not ask us to do something that He would not be capable of doing through us. So we have it. So we've been shown favor. We've been shown favor by a spirit. By His sweet Spirit that is in our hearts. We have been shown favor. And now that's what God wants us to now go and show the world. He wants us to have a sweet Spirit in ourself. He wants us to have a sweet Spirit in this worship service. He wants us to have a sweet Spirit when we leave this worship place and we go out and we begin to live our lives outside in this world. He wants that same sweet Spirit to be given out to the world. Amen? So we have been blessed with His sweet Spirit. Can I tell you there is a sweet spirit at First Baptist West. You, I hope you know that. But can I tell you something? Not every place has that. Not every place has that. So that's why God has called us, the Scripture tells us, strive hard for the unity that's in you. That this is not something God provides the sweet spirit. We have to strive to keep it. But can I tell you again, we have been shown favor. We at First Baptist West are strategically placed where we are in the time we're living, in the situation that's going on around us. He has placed us here to make a difference. He has shown us favor so that we can help be influential to society. So the first thing again is Esther was not there by accident. Folks, we, none of us are here. None of us are in this time. This church is not functioning the way it is by accident. God has called us to make a difference in a time such as this. But the second thing is that I want you to look at is Esther had a calling. That's what Mordecai was trying to tell her. You, you, you have a calling, Esther. You have a calling. The first calling that, that she had was to lift up her voice. She had to lift up her voice. She couldn't be silent. She could not be passive. As a matter of fact, he warns her about that in verse 14. Or verse 13 even, he says, Do not think that in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent this time, relief and deliverance will arise from, for the Jews in another, in another place. But you and your, your father's house will perish. What he's basically saying is, Esther, you've got, it's time to, you've been called to lift up your voice. Don't be passive. You can't be passive about this any longer. Over the years, I believe the church has tried to be passive. The church has tried to, uh, not, not be standing out, not, not to be out in the open too much. And as a matter of fact, we've even been trying to, uh, limit ourselves. And can I tell you, it has hurt society by us doing that? By the church being passive? Society has been hurt by it. As a matter of fact, the quote that I found this week, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said this, Our lives begin to end when we become silent over the things that matter. When we become silent over the things that matter, folks, 
our life as we know it is beginning to end. So can I tell you that even in our great nation today, that if you love freedom, that if you love the way our nation was built upon, if you love the way Christ has worked through the church, my friends, we better not be passive. Because the minute we start being passive, the life as we know it is beginning to shift and end. So we cannot be passive any longer. As a matter of fact, what uh, sometimes the church I believe we've done is maybe hoping that the world would even leave us alone. To live by the motto, well, we'll live and let live. Let them, let the world have what they want. They'll leave us alone and we'll have what we want. Can I tell you that doesn't work? It doesn't work that way. Society, America, Oklahoma, Lawton needs the church to not be passive any longer. We, we don't want to try to let things go by us anymore. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of times the church might even think, well, if we'll just be quiet, people will leave us alone. If we just be quiet, Satan will leave us alone. Listen, the worst thing the church can have in their mind is to be left alone by Satan because the minute Satan's leaving us alone, that means we're not doing anything. The minute society leaves us alone, we're not doing something right. So we cannot be passive. So he tells Esther, Esther, you need to lift up your voice. Now's the time. But not only to lift up your voice, but the second thing is, he says, Esther, you, you've got a calling to make a difference. you got a calling to make a difference. Be an influence to society. The thing that I've realized, my friend, is this. I believe that the church is about 20 to 25 years behind the culture. What I mean by that is, is that for the past 20 to 25 years, the church has decided there are certain issues we just don't talk about in the church. We can't talk about that. We can't bring up homosexuality. We can't bring up pornography. We cannot bring up abuse. Those are things the world talks about, but the church, we don't talk about those things. And you know what happened? By us in the church deciding we weren't supposed to talk about those things, society went rampant with it. And now we're 20 years behind the culture. I began to think as I was planning this, what would it be like if 20 to 25 years ago when those taboo topics were not being discussed would have been discussed? On how do we deal with it? How, how do we reach people? How, how, do, how, do, how do we help people that are caught up in this rather than ignoring it and putting our head in the sand and letting it go? What difference could we have made? But now we're so far behind. All of these things that we should be against that we should be helping people out of, folks, it's running rampant now because we refuse to talk about them. But we got to begin to talk about these things. We got to be influential. Too many of us are here today. There are too many in Oklahoma, there are too many Christians in America today that we can't make a difference. We're too powerful to not have an influence. We just need to wake up. We need to begin to speak up. We need to begin to make a difference as Mordecai called Esther to do. Make a difference. Stand up. Because if you don't, it's going to be too late. Edmund Burke once said this, the only thing necessary for triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Just sit back Put your head in the sand. Hope it will all go away. And when we do that, then evil triumphs. For good men, righteous men, to do nothing. He said, Esther, you could do nothing. But don't you think that it's going to go away by you doing nothing. Church, listen to me. We have an important time coming up next month. And we can decide, and many, unfortunately, many Christians have decided to do nothing. And I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. But I'm going to tell you, folks, it's time for the Christians to stand up and vote. 
It's time for us. Do you know we could make a difference? But too many have decided that's not for us. We need to back out. The world is telling you, church, get out of the politics. Good men, do nothing and let it go. I think we've done that for too long now. Evil is triumphing. Because good people who love Christ, who are powerful with His power in number, even in number, we could make a difference. And he says, Esther, you can sit back and you do nothing, but don't fool yourself into thinking that it's going to go away because it's not going away. Folks, church, listen, the stuff we're dealing with, can I tell you this straight up? It's not going away. It's not stopping. As a matter of fact, it's rolling fast now. And there's not, listen, there's not much that can stop where we're going right now. There's not much. But I believe one that could, and that's Christ. Working through the lives of His people. Trying to make a difference. Because we cannot let evil triumph any longer. It's time for the church to let their voice be heard. It's time for the church to make a difference. And the last thing, very quickly, is to resist evil. We look and we see Esther's calling was to resist evil. He said, you've got to do something because even you and your family in this castle, in this kingdom, you will be taken down by the evil. You can stick your head in the sand, but when you do, chances are your head's going to get chopped off. You need to resist that evil today. My friend, listen to me. We need to resist evil because one thing that Esther had to understand, one thing that you and I need to understand is good cannot coexist with evil. It can't. It's impossible. Even though we're being called by society and by the, by the world to say, church, there's a great call for you to to in the secular world, let's let's just get along again. Let's live and let live. But the only way that the church and secular society can coexist is if the church begins to adopt secular society's rules. That's the only way we can get along. That's the only way that we can make a difference. If we begin to adapt the world's philosophy, and folks, listen to me, there's a lot of churches today that are beginning to adopt the world's philosophy to be able to get along with society. Let's make it easy for people. Let's make it joyful for people. Let's make it feel good for people. Let's not let the world feel threatened by the church. Let's exist with the evil. Folks, we can't. We can't coexist with evil. One is going to take the other over. As a matter of fact, we look in the scripture, Second Corinthians chapter six, verses four, fourteen and fifteen says this do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord Christ with Belial? Or what part of a believer with an unbeliever? This idea of merging together can't happen, he says, because in, in this one part, and what communion has light with darkness? There cannot be a communion with light and darkness. One of them overtakes the other. But praise God, can I tell you this? Light overtakes the darkness. Light overtakes the darkness. It only takes a small light to, to, to vanquish the darkness. But can I tell you this? They don't exist together. God is saying here, how can the church and the world get along? Only if the church settles itself down and accepts the things of the world. Then can I tell you, we're diminishing the light. The church cannot exist with the, with the world with the light shining. 
because it will dispel that darkness. But too many of us want to say, let's just get along here. But it cannot coexist, my friends. Now, I'm not calling for us to go out and take on the world's mentality and become destructive and begin to beat people down, begin to destroy things, begin to riot, begin to, to burn down buildings. I'm not calling for the church to do that. that. You know what we would have just done by doing that? We'd dispelled the light and gone into the darkness. We'd have been doing things the way the world does it. Why, how do we do it? How do we stand up? We stand up by saying, Jesus is Lord. The Scripture is our standard. But we love the world. We're going to show you Jesus. There's going to be a time that we may stand. And when the world sees us stand, listen to me, they'll not be happy with it. But we need to stand, my friend. For such a time as this, can I tell you this? America needs the church to stand up. Now, let me tell you, they may not like the church standing up, they may not want the church standing up, but they, they do need the church standing up. Just like your children. Can I, can I divert this real quick? Your children need you to discipline them, to, con, to, to guide them, to stand up. And sometimes, oh, I know this is going to send shivers down some of your parents' spine, but sometimes to tell your kids no. But when you do, can I tell you this? Your kids are not going to go, Oh, thank you, Mother. Thank you, Father, for telling me no. I really wanted that so desperately. I was ready to throw myself down on the floor and scream and holler. But thank you for telling me no. I accept it. No, they're not. But do you know what you still need to do? You still need to tell them no. To guide them. Because it will grow them. And they one day, oh, one day, just like many of us older adults now, we can look back and realize our parents weren't stupid. Amen? I've gotten to go back before my parents passed away, praise the Lord, and I've had to tell them, thank you. Thank you for not letting me do everything I wanted to do. Thank you for not letting me go everywhere I want to go. Thank you, thank you. You knew what you were doing. But can I tell you, I'm afraid there's a generation of, of, of young people that won't ever be able to go back and tell their parents thank you about that because their parents aren't doing it. Just as a child needs guidance and discipline, so society needs the church to stand up. The world needs us not to get along with them so much. The world needs to sense the influence of Jesus in their lives. Who is going to do it other than us? And when will we do it? When's the best time to do it other than a time such as this? Now. This is the time. You may be here, you may be home, and you say, well, I, I don't know Jesus is my Savior. I don't know. None of this is making sense to me. Can I encourage you today to, to pray, to call upon the name of the Lord, to receive Him into your life, that you could receive Him and say, God, forgive me. I know that I'm lost. I need that guidance. God, I need you in my life. I need Jesus. Would you forgive me my sin? Come into my heart and to save me. Transform me, God. My friend, that's, that's for you today. If you're here and you don't know Jesus, if you're at home and you don't know Jesus, today's the day to do that. Would you come? Maybe you're here or even at home and you say, well, Pastor, I know that I'm saved. But I realize that, man, I've, I, I've been one of those that's been trying to be really passive in, in this. And I've not been showing Jesus. I've not been standing up and telling the world how much Jesus means to me and what He can do for them. I want to be placed strategically for such a time as this, Pastor. Help me. God, help me. Help our church be ready for a time such as this. We can make a difference. Lawton needs First Baptist West to stand up. 
They need us to show Jesus in our lives. They need to hear us proclaim the name of Jesus. Oklahoma needs it. America needs it. And it can start right here today. Right there at home with you today by saying, here I am, God. Here I am. I'd like to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes as we step into this time. I'm going to ask the praise team to come on back up and we're going to enter into a time of praise and worship again. We want you to sing along with us here in a moment. But before we do, man, I want, to, I want you to settle something in your heart right now. I want to know, do you know Jesus as your Savior? Has there ever been a moment in that time in your life that you've called upon God and said, God, I know I'm lost. I need direction. I need a purpose. And so, God, I receive you into my life through Jesus Christ. Forgive me of my sins. My friend, if you're here today or you're at home today and you've never done that, man, you don't need anything else other than Jesus right here. You need to call upon his name. But if you're here and you're at home and you say, I know I'm saved, but man, I, I want a bold spirit. I want a bold spirit today. I, I, want, I want to lift my voice. I want to share Jesus with people. I want to show them Jesus in my life. I want to be that difference to my school. I want to be that difference to my workplace. I want to be that difference out in society. I want to be that difference today. Would you join us in that? Just committing your heart to it. Would you do that today? If you're there out and watching this and you need to pray with somebody, just call our church office. 536-4227 someone's there already listening to take your call ready to visit with you, pray with you if you're right here man I'll be down front ready ready to pray with you, to help you, to encourage you folks in just a moment let's stand to sing and when we do we're going to stand as a people ready to let our voices be heard Father hear our prayer today change our hearts this morning embolden us, give us a sweet sweetness about us that, Father, that the world can see the difference between us and them. So, the Lord, they'll desire to have what we have. But, Lord, let us not stick our head in the sand any longer. We're too powerful. There's too many. And, Lord, we got too much of a, a, a powerful spirit through you to not be able to make a difference today. Let us do that. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me as we enter into this time?